June 23, 1944, Mid-Atlantic Ocean. The Japanese submarine I-52 glides through a corridor of black water, its diesel engines humming softly beneath 15,000 feet of darkness. Inside, 94 men breathe recycled air in confidence, convinced the Atlantic is still theirs. Commander Uno Kamio checks his charts, unaware that far above, American aircraft are already listening. From the night sky, an Avenger torpedo bomber drops a string of small metal cylinders. They splash gently, spreading across the surface like floating beads. Moments later, invisible sound waves begin echoing through the depths. The ocean itself has started whispering. In the headphones of an American radio man, the I-52's propellers pulse like a heartbeat. The sea is talking back, revealing the submarine's every move. Within three hours, the crew of I-52 will vanish, their fate sealed not by depth charges alone, but by a revolution in technology. In the early years of the Pacific War, Japan's submarine fleet was among the most advanced in the world. Dozens of long-range boats, sleek, heavily armed and crewed by elite sailors, slipped across vast oceans with disciplined precision. Their doctrine was rooted in pre-war naval theory. Submarines existed to scout for the fleet, shadow enemy task forces, and strike warships at decisive moments. At first, the system worked. Japanese submarines prowled the Pacific after Pearl Harbor, torpedoing cruisers and carriers, landing reconnaissance teams, and tracking Allied movements from Hawaii to Australia. Commanders prided themselves on tactical excellence and stealth, viewing their mission as an extension of the Imperial Navy's samurai tradition, precise, courageous, and honorable. But while Japan hunted enemy fleets, the United States hunted something far more strategic, supply lines. American submarines began targeting Japanese merchant shipping, strangling the empire's lifeblood of oil, rice, and steel. Each month, fewer tankers reached home ports. By late 1943, Japanese officers noticed a troubling pattern. Every time a submarine surfaced to recharge batteries, American aircraft seemed to appear almost instantly. Depth charges exploded with uncanny accuracy. Radios picked up strange signals and frequencies they couldn't decipher. Beneath the surface calm, unease began to spread among crews who once believed the sea itself protected them. The ocean that had been their refuge was slowly becoming a trap engineered by unseen forces. By 1944, the Pacific had become an invisible battlefield of sound. American engineers, drawing from British innovations, perfected a new weapon that would change naval warfare forever, the sonobuoy. A small, battery-powered cylinder no longer than a man's arm, it floated on the ocean's surface and listened for the faint mechanical pulse of a submarine's propellers. Each buoy transmitted what it heard to the aircraft above through radio waves, creating a live underwater map of everything moving below. To the Japanese Navy, this was science fiction made real. Aircraft no longer needed to see a submarine to kill it. They could listen, track, and strike through miles of water and darkness. The United States turned these devices into an industrial miracle. Thousands of sonobuoys were mass-produced monthly, dropped in coordinated patterns that turned the ocean into a vast acoustic grid. When combined with radar, FM sonar, and acoustic homing torpedoes, the system rendered stealth nearly impossible. Every dive, every propeller turn, every whispered mechanical vibration was a beacon to the hunters above. In Tokyo, reports of submarines vanishing without warning began to circulate through the naval general staff. Crews who once boasted of their silent running now whispered of the talking sea. They didn't yet know how the Americans were finding them, but they knew they were being heard. The age of unseen technology had arrived, and it would soon claim its first victims in spectacular fashion. For the men inside Japan's undersea fleet, the war was becoming psychological. Each patrol began with the same ritual, tight smiles, folded flags, whispered prayers, but beneath the surface, fear was spreading faster than they dared admit. Submarines that reported in one week vanished the next. Convoy escorts spoke of American aircraft arriving with impossible precision, dropping depth charges the moment a sub dived. Survivors described the attacks as if the ocean itself had turned against them. One captain wrote that bombs fell as though guided by ears beneath the water. No one could explain it. Even experienced officers like Commander Tatsunasuke Ariyazumi, one of Japan's most respected tacticians, began doubting his charts and training. The Navy's confidence once its defining strength was eroding dive by dive. In cramped steel corridors every sound mattered, the groan of hull plates, the hum of electric motors, the faint tick of the depth gauge. Men froze when they heard anything unusual because now they feared the Americans could hear it too. The silence that once protected them became unbearable. Officers encouraged superstition to maintain morale.
Crews carried lucky charms, whispered prayers to the sea gods, even tapped the periscope housing before diving. None of it worked. Each voyage felt more like a death sentence than a mission. By mid-1944, whispers among submarine crews carried a haunting refrain, the sea has ears. They were right. What Japan's submariners didn't yet know was that the enemy wasn't guessing their position. It was listening to them in real time. The Americans had built machines that could hear through the depths, track through silence, and strike without ever seeing their prey. The war beneath the waves had become a contest of technology versus tradition, and technology was winning. Japan entered the war believing size and craftsmanship defined superiority. Its engineers built the largest submarines in history, the I-400 class, capable of launching aircraft, circling the globe, and striking distant shores. Each was a masterpiece of steel and ambition. But in the Pacific, grandeur was meaningless against the United States' unseen network of radar, sonar, and signal intelligence. While Japan crafted a few magnificent vessels, America produced entire systems. Sonobuoys, radar arrays, and acoustic torpedoes were only the front line of a far greater machine, a logistical empire that could manufacture, ship, and replace every component faster than Japan could even design them. American shipyards like Mare Island and electric boat launched submarines at a rhythm Japan couldn't imagine. In the time it took Tokyo to complete one I-class submarine, U.S. factories delivered dozens of Gato and Balo-class boats, each armed with advanced sensors and standardized spare parts ready for global deployment. The industrial gap was staggering. Japan's wartime production barely sustained 70 operational submarines. The United States built over 300 in four years and kept them supplied with fuel, torpedoes, and intelligence. Even the smallest American escort carriers carried the instruments of a new kind of warfare. Radar to detect surface contacts, sonobuoys to locate divies, and Fido torpedoes that hunted sound itself. Technology had replaced chance. Skill alone could no longer save a crew. As American innovation spread across the oceans, Japanese commanders began to realize that courage and experience meant little against mathematics, machinery, and mass production. The coming battles would not be decided by seamanship, but by science. And for one Japanese submarine, the I-52, that truth was about to become terrifyingly clear. June 23, 1944, North Atlantic, 870 nautical miles west of the Cape Verde Islands. The night was calm. A faint crescent moon traced silver lines across the ocean as I-52, Japan's prized cargo submarine, surfaced to recharge her batteries. She carried two tons of gold, 120 tons of tin, and critical war materials bound for Germany. Commander Uno Kamio had just completed a secret rendezvous with the German U-530 to exchange radar equipment and two technicians. The transfer went flawlessly. The crew relaxed. The Atlantic felt quiet, too quiet. At 11.40 p.m., that silence broke. High above, an Avenger torpedo bomber from the escort carrier USS Bog picked up a radar contact, a blip slicing across the black water. Lieutenant Commander Jesse D. Taylor circled once, confirmed, and began his run. Flares dropped from the sky, igniting the ocean in orange light. Below, Cameo ordered a crash dive. The submarine plunged into darkness, but the Americans didn't lose her. Taylor released a single purple sona buoy. It floated silently, transmitting the rhythmic pulse of I-52's propellers back to his aircraft. For the first time in naval history, a submarine was being hunted by sound alone. Taylor tracked the echo like a heartbeat. He released a Mark 24 Fido acoustic torpedo designed to home in on propeller noise. Moments later, a dull thud echoed through the sonar headphones, then the metallic crack of pressure hulls collapsing. The I-52 was gone. Ninety-four men and sixteen passengers sank with her to seventeen thousand feet, never knowing what had killed them. The wire recordings of that attack, labeled Gordon Wire Number 1 and Number 2, captured the entire sequence. The ping of sonar, the rumble of explosion, the ocean swallowing steel. For the Japanese Navy, the message was unmistakable. The Americans could now hear through the sea itself. The sinking of I-52 was not an isolated victory. It was a demonstration proof that the United States had achieved total acoustic dominance. Within months, the same combination of radar, sonobuoys, and homing torpedoes formed the backbone of hunter-killer groups roaming every ocean. Escort carriers like USS Bog, USS Card, and USS Core turned the Atlantic and Pacific into living laboratories of technological warfare. But the decisive blow came a year later. Operation Barney, June 1945, the final American submarine offensive of the war. 
nine U.S. submarines equipped with experimental FM sonar slipped through the Tsushima Strait into the Sea of Japan, a body of water Japan had declared impregnable. The strait was mined with thousands of underwater explosives. Japanese intelligence called it the Wall of Steel. The Americans called it Hell's Bells for the distinctive chime their sonar made when it detected nearby mines. One by one, the submarines threaded through the labyrinth. Twenty hours submerged, no light, no surfacing, guided only by FM sonar that painted minefields as ghostly arcs of sound on glowing screens. When they emerged, they were inside Japan's last sanctuary. For two weeks, the American submarines hunted freely, sinking 28 Japanese ships, including a destroyer and a submarine, without losing a single vessel. To the Japanese high command, the news was unbelievable. The Sea of Japan had fallen. If American submarines could navigate minefields once thought impenetrable, then nowhere on earth was safe. For Japan's remaining submarine crews, it was the moment of realization. The ocean no longer belonged to them. Their courage, their engineering, their honor, all were powerless against a nation that could hear through metal, see through darkness, and outproduce the world. The destruction of I-52 marked the beginning of the end for Japan's submarine fleet. Over the next 12 months, the Imperial Navy would lose more than 130 submarines, nearly its entire undersea arm. For the men who survived, survival itself felt like betrayal. Each new patrol was shorter, deadlier, and more hopeless than the last. By 1945, the once proud submarine service that had sailed with confidence from Yakasuka and Kure was reduced to fragments. Fuel shortages kept most boats docked. Spare parts were non-existent. Communications were unreliable. Crews were sent to sea in vessels barely repaired from previous missions. The Imperial Navy could no longer protect its own coastline, much less project power across the Pacific. At sea, American submarines and hunter-killer groups moved with impunity. Their radar spotted Japanese vessels before sunrise, their sonobuoys tracked them through storms, their torpedoes hunted them in silence. The Japanese crews no longer fought for victory, they fought for moments of survival in an ocean that now answered to another nation. The Pacific had turned into an American domain of sound, steel, and science. When the war finally ended, the surviving Japanese submarine officers were ordered to surrender their vessels to the Americans. What they saw aboard U.S. submarines left them speechless. Lieutenant Commander Nambu of I-401, once proud of commanding the largest submarine ever built, toured the USS Segundo after his surrender. The controls were smaller, the layout simpler, but everything worked flawlessly. Sonar screens flickered with crisp precision. Radar swept the horizon miles beyond visual range. The fire control computer, a compact electromechanical brain, could calculate firing solutions in seconds. Nambu later confessed to interrogators that his realization of Japan's defeat came not from atomic bombs or naval losses, but from overhearing American radio chatter, its effortless coordination across thousands of miles. What he saw aboard Segundo only confirmed it. Japan had fought a nation that mastered the science of war as thoroughly as the art of production. In dry docks and shipyards, Japanese engineers studied American systems with awe and despair. Their magnificent I-class submarines, built with passion and pride, were obsolete before they ever fired a shot. The war beneath the waves was over. The machines that had listened, hunted, and struck had rewritten the laws of the ocean, the war beneath the waves ended not with the roar of guns, but with silence, the silence of understanding. For Japan's submariners, defeat came as a sound, the distant ping of sonar, the steady hum of American machinery, the ocean itself whispering their position to unseen hunters. What they learned in those final years would echo far beyond 1945. They discovered that courage and craftsmanship were no match for a system that combined science, mass production, and precision. The United States had turned industry into strategy, transforming technology into an invisible weapon. Japan's submarines, magnificent but few, were monuments to a philosophy already outdated. In the decades that followed, those lessons reshaped Japan's identity. The nation that once built colossal machines began building perfect systems, small, reliable, efficient, and unmatched in quality. From shipyards to factories, the same principle endured, technology not tradition decides survival. For the submariners who heard the ocean betray them, it was a truth paid in blood and silence. The sea had once been Japan's domain, but by 1945, it belonged to those who could make it speak.